Good afternoon. Um, the original title for this talk was actually Auto Layout from Leading to Trailing. What a great title, I thought, because I was really proud of that name because it sounds like from A to Z, which kind of incorporates everything you need to know about auto layout. And it's even using the terminology of auto layout, right? Leading and trailing, that's auto layout terms. So I submitted my proposal to UIConf on the website, and then someone, did, someone commented on my proposal that this might actually not be as good as I thought, the title, because from leading to trailing also has a different meaning, right? It means like falling behind in a race. Yeah, I was probably a little bit too constrained in my thinking. Luckily, there's an easy fix for this. I just changed the title to be from trailing to leading. And that's the goal of this talk, to help you master auto layout, get better at this particular discipline. So let's get started. Hi, I'm Misha. I'm an iOS developer at Intif Kupferwerk, a company located in Munich. We develop native mobile apps for other big companies who either don't have app developers themselves or trust us that we're going to do a better job at it. Um, I love coding in Swift. I work a lot with uh, Interface Builder. And as you might have noticed, I love beautiful designs and animations. Now, auto layout is a pretty mysterious thing to um, many developers. And there's a very good reason why Apple um, has two WWDC um, videos or talks, um, which are called Mysteries of Auto Layout. And the reason for that is that there are so many methods related to auto layouts that all kind of sound very similar. There's layout subviews, then there's layout if needed, then you have set needs layout and set needs update constraints. You have set needs display, we have update constraints and update constraints if needed. And you never really know like which, which of these methods should I, should I call like, in order to achieve what I want to achieve. And then you end up like, trying out every single one of those methods, and you get really angry because nothing is really working. Right? So auto layout is pretty much a huge black box right? for many developers. We never know what's happening. Um, well, the good news is that um, this set needs display method in the lower left corner Right? It's not related to layout at all. So let's get rid of this. We don't need to care about this today. So that raises the question, what is layout? What is related to layout? Well, in iOS, layout is actually, um, it defines what to draw and where to draw it on screen. Um, it does not define how to draw it, right? Because that's the drawing algorithm. It's a completely different thing. So let's uh, have a look at a concrete example. Right? I created a beautiful app here. Just a regular profile view. I'm pretty proud of it. Um, and now, what is layout here? Well, first of all, we decompose um, this user interface into individual components. Right? So we have the navigation bar on top. Then we have a profile, profile image. We have a name label, or maybe two. Then we have a rating view and a description text view. Right? That already answers the question, what? Now we need to answer the question, where? Where do we place all those views? Um, well, in order to answer the question where, in programming and in mathematics, we always need a coordinate system. right? And our coordinate system here is actually our device coordinate system. right? And now, if we only focus on one component, on one view, the name label, for example, we can answer the question where for that particular label. Right? So first of all, we have the x coordinate, we have the y coordinate, and then we have a width and a height. It's really simple. Right? Now, the tuple of the x and the y coordinates describe the view's origin. And the tuple of the width and the height describe the view's size. And all these things together are the view's frame. So to put it simple, layout is just another word for determining the frames for all views on screen. How do we do that? Well, the easiest thing to do is just write down the frame explicitly, right? Just do manual positioning. That's the traditional approach, how it was done several years ago. We just write button.frame for this simple layout, for example. We just write down the explicit values. Now, the problem with this approach is that um, this worked great several years ago when we only had one particular device size. Um, for the iPhone SE, for example, this would be uh, 320 pixels wide. But now we have all sorts of different devices, right? We have iPads, we have the iPhone 6 and 7 Plus, and all sorts of different, different dimensions, right? Um, so with this manual positioning approach, when we um, have a different device, um, 
then this approach doesn't work anymore because this is how we would want our button to resize, right? We, what we actually want to have is equal horizontal padding to the screen on both sides, right? But this, this doesn't work with manual positioning. Um, we would need to specify a different frame for each screen, um, for each screen size, actually, and that's a really tedious ver work and not scalable at all. Um, so a way better way to do this um, is not to set the frame explicitly, but we rather describe our intention semantically, which is we want a fixed spacing to the screen edges on both sides of the button. Um, and for that, um, we add these tiny blue lines in Interface Builder. We can, of course, also do that in code to indicate the spacings, um, which we will later call constraints. Right? So now when we use a different uh, device with a different screen size, the iPhone 7 Plus, for example, it um, resizes automatically. It's the way we want it to be. And that's the basic idea of auto layout, right? To create beautiful user interfaces that look great on any device with any device orientation. Or with other words, to create adaptive user interfaces. Now, in order to get there, we have a mission to accomplish. Uh, first of all, we need to find a convenient way to describe the frames uh, relative to each other. Right? And the first step to get there um, is to describe the lay in, in order to get to there to describe layouts in an expressive way, um, is to find names for the edges of a view. Right? So let's do that. We have a generic view here, and then we define the leading edge and the trailing edge, and then we define the top and the bottom edge, and we call these things layout anchors. Why do we choose these strange names, leading and trailing, and don't just go with left and right? Well, there is actually a left and a right layout anchor, but we don't want to use them in most cases. And that's because there are some languages that read from um, right to left, Arabic, for example. Right? And user interfaces should always follow the direction of the local language. As developers, we don't really want to think about the language specifics, and that's why we have those specific layout anchors, leading and trailing. For Arabic, um, the trailing layout anchors on the left side and the leading layout anchors on the right side. And for English language and all left to right languages, it's, it's the other way around. Now, all these layout anchors that we've just seen, the four layout anchors, are the base layout anchors. We have two horizontal layout anchors along the x-axis, leading and trailing, and we have two um, vertical layout anchors along the y-axis, top and bottom. And what's really cool about that is that from these base layout anchors, we can actually deduct other layout anchors that are really convenient to describe our layouts in a very expressive way. Right? We have two dimension layout anchors, um, first of all, the width, which can be expressed through the leading and the trailing layout anchor, right? It's just the difference bet between those two. Um, and then we have the height, which can also be expressed as the difference between the bottom and the top layout anchor. And then we can define um, center uh, layout anchors. We have the horizontal center, center X, which is basically the average between the leading and the trailing um, layout anchor, and the vertical center, which is the average between the top and the bottom layout anchor. Right? If we're 100% correct, of course, we need to use the absolute values here for those equations. Um, but let's stick, stick to this because it's a lot easier. I don't want to make things overly complicated. And then we have some special layout anchors um, that are only used for views that display text, like labels and text views. And they are pretty self-explanatory. We have the first baseline layout anchor and the last baseline layout anchor. And with that, we've already completed our first mission, right? Uh, we've found a convenient way to describe frames relative to each other. Yeah. Um, so let's look at some, some examples what we can do with that already. Um, for example, we can describe a layout that aligns the leading edges of two views, like in this image. We simply set, set the first view's layout anchor equal to the second view's layout anchor. It's that easy. Or we can also align views next to each other. Right? We set the first view's trailing layout anchor equal to the second view's layout, uh, leading layout anchor. Or we can require that two views all, always have the same width by simply equating the width layout anchors of both views. We can do the same thing with the height, of course. Right? And finally, we can also enforce that a view must always have the shape of a square right? by equating the view's width layout anchor with the same view's height layout anchor. So that's already a lot of things we can do with, with this simple uh, declaration of layout anchors. 
And when we look closely at all those equations here um, that we used to describe our layouts on the previous slides, and we don't even need to look that closely to notice that they all follow one pattern, one very simple pattern, and it's simply anchor one equals anchor two. That's incredibly simple. Is that all we need to work with auto layout? Not so fast. Um, what about spacings between the views? Right? Uh, in one of the previous examples, we aligned two views next to each other without any spacing. But now we do want some spacing between them. So instead of simply equating the two layout anchors, we now need to add a constant. Right? So let's add the constant down here. And we have view one trailing plus eight equals view two leading. Or a similar situation when we want to use some indentation and align views like in a list, like this. And we also need a constant to describe the spacing between the first view's leading layout anchor and all the other view's leading layout anchors. Right? So for view two, for example, it would read like this. Now, it's pretty obvious that these equations don't really fit with our previous pattern this pattern, right? So we need to modify our formula in order to describe the layouts from the previous uh, two slides by simply adding a constant. So let's do that. Let's add a constant in here. And for reasons of convenience, I'll just swap the two sides of the equation because it'll become handy later on. Isn't there still something missing? Yeah, there is, because otherwise I wouldn't ask the question. Um, so what if we want to have a view that's twice as wide as another view? That's interesting, for example, when we want to create columns for a newspaper app or something um, with different widths. So if we want to have one view and the other view is like twice as wide. And we need a factor down here, right? We need to write view to width equals twice the size of view one width. Or if we want to have a view in the shape of a DNA4 paper. Um, for all the Americans, DNA4 paper is defined as uh, an aspect ratio of 1 over square root of 2. <laughs> so again, we need a factor here right, to describe this layout. Um, so we, ne we need that factor whenever we want to set a fixed aspect ratio for views with a shape other than a square. Now, same story as before. The old pattern isn't fitting anymore. <laughs> Right? So we kind of need to modify our pattern again to account for the multiplier. Let's add the multiplier in here. Um, just as, an, as a note, the constant in here um, is zero in these two cases. Um, most, uh, most of the times, it's just like that, that you either have, have a multiplier or a constant, but theoretically, it can be both. Both can be non-zero. Does it get any more complicated? No, it doesn't. Um, because that's actually the final constraint formula. And surprise, every single line, uh, every single one of those tiny blue lines in Interface Builder represents such a formula. They're called constraints because they constrain the possible layouts. When you add enough constraints, um, then there's only one possible layout, right? And that's what we want, what, what we want to make sure when we create user interfaces with auto layout. So a constraint is a linear equation, the kind of equation that describes a, st a straight line. Right, you should all remember that from school. <laughs> and now we have a powerful way to describe our layouts with constraints. But there's one very important question. How do we get from the constraints to the frames? Right? Because in the end, the system needs to know where to position all our views. How do we transform these things? Short reminder, these are the values that describe, a, that describe a frame, and these are the base layout anchors. And again, we use our little trick. We can express um, the, base layout, uh, the, the frame in terms of the base layout anchors. For the origin, the x and the y value, it's very clear. Um, and the width and the height, we've already discussed before. So with other words, um, if we know the actual values of the four base layout anchors, leading, trailing, top, and bottom, um, we also know the view's frame. So all we got to do is um, we need to find the coordinates of the base layout anchors, and then we're ready to go. Then we know where to put the frames and what size they have in screen. Let's look at an example. Um, we have a very simple um, user interface here 
Um, and we just add a single view to our root view. Um, and that's all inside our coordinate space, of course. Um, let's add some constraints to define this layout. Right? We add a leading spacing constraint, we add a trailing spacing constraint, and top spacing constraint, and then we give um, v1 a fixed height of 20 pixels. And that already describes our layout. Right? So in the first uh, three constraint equations, the upper three equations, we always have a base layout anchor uh, of v1 included. Right? But the last equation includes a height layout anchor, which is a deducted layout anchor. Right? So we first have to get rid of that. Um, and we can do that, right? because remember, it's a deducted layout anchor. We can express it through the base layout anchors. Um, so I just um, swap these two formulas here. I just replace it. Um, and now we have um, a set of linear equations. Right? We have four equations um, with four variables. Um, and if you remember correctly from linear algebra, there's some fancy thing that um, the set of n equations with n variables is always solvable um, if those equations are linear independent. Right? But how do we get those, um, the root views base layout anchors, like the one on the right side that are not in blue? Those are still also kind of like variables. How do we, how, how do we get those? It's fairly simple, because after all, our view is embedded. Um, it's been presented on screen, so, um, and the screen has a coordinate system, so um, we can actually pretty easily get those values. The origin is defined as 0, 0 in the upper left corner, and uh, then we have the screen width and the screen height as the root views dimensions. So uh, that's how we get our root views space layout anchors. Leading layout anchor is 0, the trailing layout anchor is 375 for an iPhone 6 or 7, for example, for, these, for that case. Um, the top layout anchor is 0, and the bottom layout anchor is 667. Right. So now we can simply substitute um, the values in our constraint equations with that particular um, values. And as you can see, we actually um, can resolve this equation. We, we get the actual coordinates. Um, for, for our view one space layout anchors, right? And that's possible be, because we already knew the, or the other thing, by the way, we don't need it anymore because it's not included in those um, um, constraint equations. And that's only possible here, uh, resolving the constraints, because we already knew the values of the super view space layout anchor, and that's a general rule, right? Um, if a view knows its own frame, it can always compute the frames of all its subviews. Um, so if the outermost frame, the outermost frame is always known, right? It's the windows frame, the screens. And for that reason, the layout flow is always from top to bottom, right? We start with the outermost view with a screen, with a window, and then that um, computes the frames of its subviews, and then those subviews compute the frames of their subviews, and so on, right? So the layout flow is always from super view to subview. Let's make the user interface a little more interesting and add a second view. And then we add some constraints. We add a leading constraint to align it with the first view. And then we add a center constraint to center it in the root view. And then we add a fixed width constraint. And we could also add several other constraints. right? Um, and that's still a very simple layout. We only have two views. Um, for each of them, we need at least four constraints to, to um, describe the layout uh, non-ambiguously. Um, but the real user interface will have many more views, right? Um, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe, maybe even 50. Um, so we'll end up with a dozen of constraint equations. Who wants to solve all those equations? Anyone? I don't want. So the good news is you don't have to do that, because the system, sets, uh, the, the system solves this set of linear equations for you. And that's exactly what happens inside the UIView method layout subviews. Right? The system computes the actual frames of all subviews by solving a set of linear equations. Right? It takes the constraints and it transforms them um, into the actual frames. When exactly does this happen? Um, it's always a very important question. Well. Layout subviews is called by the system during a so-called layout pass. What's a layout pass? Well, sorry guys, it's a black box again for us for the moment. 
But it's a black box of which we know that at some point, layout subviews is called. Right? Um, and whenever the system thinks it's necessary uh, to go for another lay layout pass, is, it triggers another round, and this happens again and again. Um, so the constraint equations are solved inside that layout pass in order to compute the actual frames. So that's why the whole thing is a layout cycle, right? The problem about this thing is that you never know exactly when a layout pass happens. Um, and sometimes you need to um, be sure that your layout has been resolved, that you actually have the, the actual frames positioned, right? Um, so you need to trigger a layout pass yourself. How do you do that? How would you do that? Well, the first thing that comes into mind is uh, call layout subviews, right? Because that's the method that transforms the constraints into the frames. You should never do that. Please don't do that. Call layout if needed instead. Why? Well, it's due to um, performance reasons, right? Um, layout subviews will always solve the set of your constraint equations, no matter what, right? Even if nothing has changed at all. The same set of linear equations would be solved over and over again, wasting processing power and memory resources. So it's a way better idea to keep track of the changes to the constraints and to your view hierarchy. And only if something changes, then you invalidate the layout. And then during a layout pass, only call layout subviews if the current layout is invalid. Right? So that raises the question, how do we keep track of the con constraint changes? How do we know if something has changed? Well, for that purpose, Apple has implemented an internal flag. Um, it's very likely it's called needs layout, so I'll stick to that for this talk. But after all, it's internal, it's private. So there's no way for me to know how it's actually called. But that would be a wise choice. <laughs> um, it, now, this flag has two states. Um, it has a valid state at the bottom, which means that all frames are properly set. This is false. And it has an invalid state, um, true, that some frames, and it means that some frames are not up to date and need to be recalculated. Now, I wasn't entirely honest with you when I said previously that layout subuse is always called during a layout pass, because it's only called if that internal flag is true. Right? Because if it's false, layout subuse is simply skipped. How does this look in code? Um, probably something like this, the layout if needed method. It does something like this. It first checks the flag if the layout is invalid. If it is, then it calls layout subviews. Otherwise, nothing happens. It's probably not Apple's original implement implementation of the method, but it's a very good way to think of it, what it does. So how do we raise this flag? How do we push it up? Because it's private, right? We cannot access this directly. We cannot just set it to true. Well. Set, uh, the needs layout um, flag is automatically set to true um, whenever you add or remove constraints, when you modify existing constraints, or when you add or remove a view from the view hierarchy. So in those cases, you don't need to think about this because it happens automatically. And needs layout is automatically set to false. When is it set to false? Well, of course, after each layout pass, right? Because then the um, frames have been resolved already, and it's in sync with the constraints. So when layout subviews has returned, then it's set to false. So in most cases, you don't need to think about invalidating the layout yourself. But there are some cases where it might be necessary to manually invalidate the layout. For example, when you change the label's text and you want it to resize automatically. And you do this by calling set needs layout. Right? All this method does is pushing the flag up, raising the flag. It sets needs layout to true. And this will force a layout subviews call in the next layout pass. Now, a combination of the two methods will force an immediate layout pass, of course, right? If we first invalidate the layout by calling set needs layout, and then we lay out, <laughs> we perform a layout pass only if it's needed, this will result in an immediate call of layout subviews. And this is a very common pattern um, in UIKit. Um, I call it the principle of invalidation, right? Um, for example, there's this pair of methods, um, set needs update constraints and update constraints if needed. And these will also result in an immediate call of update constraints. 
Now, what is update constraints all about? What's, what's that method good for? Well, normally, you should update your constraints directly after the change uh, occurred, whatever triggered the layout change, right? Um, and the Apple docs actually state that if you want to change a constraint in response to a button tab, make sure that, uh, make that directly um, in the buttons action method, right? When the change occurs. Um, and the reason for that is that it makes the control flow a lot easier to understand, right? Because it's connected to some action and results in cleaner code. And then in some cases, this might be just a little bit too slow. I always need to wait for the snail to finish. It's really too slow. Um, for example, when changing a huge number of constraints, um, or when redundantly switching the same constraints on and off many times in a row. And in these cases, you should override the update constraints method and update all your constraints inside that method at once. The reason for that is that the layout engine is a lot more efficient when it can handle all constraint changes as a batch and will yield better performance. Let's have a look at an example. Right? Um, let's say we want to toggle between um, two layouts. Right? That's the first layout where we have a label and the user interface, and we want to center it and give it a fixed width. Um, and then when we have a second um, layout of that same view where we don't want to center the label but somehow like stick it to the left edge of the screen and leave a wide spacing on the right side. Um, and we distinguish between the two layouts with a simple Boolean is centered layout. Right? So is centered layout is true for, for the left um, layout and it's false for the right uh, for the right layout. Exactly. And now we want to swap between those two layouts, for example as a result of a button tap or something. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we override the update constraints method. The first thing we need to do is to call the super implementation, of course, because otherwise your program will simply crash. And now um, we check for this um, Boolean um, that indicates our current layout is centered layout, and then we um, activate the width constraint if we have the centered layout, and we activate the center constraint if we have the, act, uh, the, the centered layout, and we deactivate the label's leading constraint when we have the centered layout. We deactivated uh, the trailing constraint uh, when we have the centered layout. Right? Now every time this method is called, the layout is updated uh, and we get the result we want. And when is it called? Um, well, it's called right before each layout pass, but again, only if the constraints have been invalidated before. Right? Um, same principle as before with uh, um, set needs layout and layout if needed. Um, or you can also um, call it manually um, by calling update constraints if needed, but in most cases you don't need to do that. Um, because, yeah, it's I think I've never, never ever needed to use that method. Um, now you invalidate the constraints, of course, same pattern as before, by calling set needs update constraints. That means that your constraints are currently invalid and your update constraints method needs to be called again. Right? It raises the, the needs update constraints flag and indicates an invalid constraints setup. Um, and of course, we need to do that. All right? And we need to invalidate the constraints each time we toggle the layout. Because otherwise, update constraint, the update constraints method won't be called. And a good place to do that is in the property observer of um, our property that um, determines the layout. I really love those property observers in Swift. Great feature. Um, so we check um, if the layout has changed, right? if it's still the old value or if it's actually changed. And only if it's, it has changed, then we invalidate the constraints. Um, right? And so that update constraints uh, will be called before the next layout pass. Whew, that was quite tough, wasn't it? Um, again, please, just a short reminder, only do this when you need to update a bunch of constraints at the same time and you need better performance. So now we've learned how to use these methods. We use set needs layout to invalidate um, the current layout and to signal um, to the system that um, the constraints need to be resolved again in order to compute the actual frames. 
um, we learned what layout if needed does, because it triggers a layout pass if the layout is invalid. We've learned what layout subviews does, it transforms the constraints into the frames. We've learned what set needs update constraints does, it invalidates the constraints, and update constraints if needed um, calls a update constraints um, method if the, layout, if the constraints are invalid. That's pretty cool, right? But, sorry for the cliche, there's still one more thing. Have you ever seen this before? Who has? Hands up. Okay. All the others are no iOS developers. <laughs> yeah. um, it's like the layout system is uh, mugging you. It's playing games with you. It's really, really annoying. I hate it. But it's really important that you stay cool about this. And one way to do that is if you look closer at what's written down there in the, in the, in the log. Right? Um, if you ever see this, and it's quite often the case most of the times, and as auto resizing mask layout constraint, um, then you know that your conflicts there in the console must be related to a mysterious property called translate auto resizing mask into constraints. And that's a source of many constraint conflicts. Who the hell came up with that name anyway? I mean, the guy must have been German probably because it sounds pretty much like Befehlskontrollschaltfläche, right? <laughs> it's definitely a very precise description what it does, right? But it's so precise that 99% of the developers don't even understand it. Yeah? So what's it all about? Well, you can think of it as a toggle um, between the auto layout and manual positioning, because sometimes you still want to use manual positioning and exactly determine where your frames, where your views should be drawn without constraints. Right? And knowing that, we can avoid many conflicts. Um, right? So if we um, use auto layout, um, then setting a views frame has literally no effect. Um, I guess many of you who first learned auto layout had that feeling, I want to set my frame, but nothing happens. Why does nothing happen? Well, the reason for that is if we set a frame manually with auto layout enabled, um, then in the next, next layout pass, con the constraints are being resolved, a new frame is computed, um, and the frame you just set is overridden. It's gone. All right. But you can still do that, set frames manually. And that's what this fancy property is for. Right? If you set it to true, if you enable it, then you enable manual positioning. And what this does is that the system will create constraints at runtime um, that emulate a fixed frame. Because with auto layout, everything is constraints in, in iOS. Right? So it will simply simulate a frame, a fixed frame, with constraints. But these constraints are hidden from you. You don't know that it happens, and then you get all the conflicts. Now, if you set this view translates auto resizing mask into constraints, um, then you can set the frame directly, just like in good old times, and won't be overridden in the next layout pass. I want to finish with uh, two simple rules that you should remember in order to avoid constraint conflicts. First rule um, is that if this translates auto resizing mask into constraints property is true then you should never add any external constraints to that view. Why? Well, because the view's size and position is already fully determined by its frame. So don't add any external constraints. And the second rule is that um, this translate auto resizing mask into constraints is automatically set to false for views you create in Interface Builder. right? But it's um, initiated with a true value for all views you create in code. Right? And it's really important to know that, because when you create views in code and you want to constrain them with other views, then the first thing you need to do is to disable this fancy property. Otherwise, you'll end up with conflicts. Otherwise, this will happen. Right? But I hope next time you see this, you'll be better prepared and you know what's going on. So there we are at the finish. Right? Thanks for running with, with me for half an hour. Uh, I hope that you, I could share some insights with you with which you can take on the lead in auto layout. Thank you. <laughs>